After two years of waiting, we finally have our first proper look at the DLC for Elden Ring. And boy, was the wait worth it. It looks absolutely mind-blowing and there is a lot to talk about. Today, I want to take you through all the new information we got through the trailer, official screenshots and Miyazaki interviews, to do a complete breakdown of the lore of the DLC with a solid dose of speculation. As well as take a look at all the new content and gameplay changes we can expect. I know I am very late to release in this video, so a lot of the things will have been already pointed out, but I am confident there will be at least some stuff you haven't seen elsewhere. And I promise you that by the end of this, you will understand why this is the most excited I have ever been for any From Software release. And with that being said, let's get started. Pure and radiant. He wields love to shrive clean the hearts of men. There is nothing more terrifying. The trailer starts off with an unknown figure standing in front of the Empyrean's cocoon in Mogwin's palace, with the decrepit arm of Mikela's carcass hanging. As many have been theorizing, it seems that this will be indeed where we will be accessing the DLC as confirmed by Miyazaki in an interview. This already makes it clear that this DLC will be balanced around the endgame of Elden Ring, as you will be required to defeat Moog, the Lord of Blood, to interact with the Cocoon. For a standard new game, the recommended character level would be at least 100 to 120, though usually most players will be around 150 by this point in game, and of course with maximum upgrades on your weapons. Interestingly, Miyazaki has mentioned that they have added a new progression mechanic to the DLC similar to attack power from Sekiro, in order to allow even the higher level characters to feel themselves growing stronger over the course of the adventure. There seems to be another condition for accessing the DLC with a very interesting lore implication, so we will leave that for a bit later. For now, we can hear a character talking about how Mikela shrives the heart of men through his love and radiance. Shriving here meaning absolving them. This is in line with everything we knew about Mikela from the base game, where he was constantly portrayed as a pure and benevolent figure who strives to help even the most destitute under the Golden Order. But also, this character goes on to say that this in itself is terrifying, reminding us again of the underlying creepiness of Mikela's love that has been hinted at before, definitely something to keep in mind. This unknown narrator could potentially be another Tarnished who followed the trail of Mikela, as Miyazaki confirmed in an interview that we will be meeting with others on the same path. And towards the end of the trailer, we can hear this NPC who seems to be guiding us towards our destination, that is, entering the Shadowlands, the world hidden within the shadow of the Earth Tree. Come now, touch the withered arm and travel to the realm of shadow. I will not be far behind. May we meet again. As we are treated to shots of this land, we can instantly recognize the map shown in the original teaser image released a year ago, where we could see what looked like Mikela riding what looked like Torrent, and we can even find the recognizable ghostly graves and ruined arches littering the field. And from this very first shot, we can already spot some very curious things. What jumps to the eyes at first are these two big castles, here and here, most likely legacy dungeons, but what's most interesting to me is this and this. The first structure is actually the same as the belfries found in the Yernia of the Lakes, from where you could access various regions of interest through portals, the eternal city of Nokron, the crumbling city of Farumazula, and Stormveil Castle. The belfries are also interesting because they have on them the only other depiction of this guy over here. This big boy is sometimes called Elden John, and was an important figure of the ancient dynasty, and has been the subject of much speculation. Keep him in the corner of your mind, because this Shadowland, as we will see, seems to have a deep connection to this civilization. The other structure we see in the horizon is actually a cathedral, very much the same layout as the Cathedral of Manu Celeste in the Moonlight Altar, but this one is actually in much better shape. In the next shot, we can see a map fragment obelisk in a small town in the fields, and it seems to somehow be covered in drapes something we'll see a lot in this trailer. The meaning of what it might represent is still unclear for now. In the background, we can see our first glimpse of the Shadow and Thorns crumbling legacy dungeon, which will serve as a landmark for us in a bit. This is our first proper wide view of the Shadowlands, and there is a lot to unpack here. 
The area in front of the character we will call the central field, for a lack of better word. Here we can see the draped town from the previous shot, and based on the angle, we can see just a bit of the Kremlin Legacy dungeon to the left. Here is the belfry and here is the cathedral. In the field, we can also see for the first time these spiraling pillars. Further back in the center, we see two legacy dungeons. The one closer seems to be a medium-sized dungeon kind of like Castle Morn, while the structure in the background is gigantic in comparison. Very possibly the main legacy dungeon of the Shadowlands. We can see a structure that visually looks like it is collecting the gold seeping from the Shadow Tree. Most definitely very purposeful imagery by From Software. And yes, it is apparently called the Shadow Tree as opposed to the Golden Tree of the Lands Between. Miyazaki did say in an interview that the name carries multiple meanings, but the most obvious one seems to be that it is a mirror or inversion of the Earth Tree in this world. And I say this world because the Shadowlands, as you might have guessed, is not physically in the Lands Between. And these lands are neither the future nor the past. They are a realm that supposedly occupies the same space as the Lands Between, but due to a yet undisclosed event, they have become inaccessible. If the Shadowlands used to be a physical place in the Lands Between, or if it was always a sort of other realm, is unclear to me as of yet. Though many have speculated that it could be a landmass that fills the lake in the middle of the map. Perhaps the most striking element of this view is the veil over the skybox of the Shadowlands. It echoes the drapes covering some of the ruins on the ground, and Miyazaki explains that one of the things they represent is how this land has been hidden away. And the similarities of this veil to the baldakin of Marika's bedroom is not a coincidence, as the major focus of the DLC would not just be to uncover the purpose of Mikela coming here, but also unveiling Marika's past, as the Shadow Realm are said to be the land where Marika first descended and attained godhood, as well as the birthplace of the Earth Tree. This reveal honestly feels dizzying to me, and is the reason why I have never been more excited for a DLC by From Software before. Not only has this been somewhat in line with what I predicted slash hoped for, for a DLC, it also seems to be that this time around, Miyazaki and the teams are not shying away from actually giving us answers on major story elements that have never been addressed in the main game. As it seems, this DLC will shed light not only on the conflicts that led to Marika being a god, but also the history of her people, the Numen. But let's come back to this a bit later. Going back to the landscape of the Shadowlands, we can see far to the left a region full of greenery and some peculiar architecture there. We actually get a closer look later in the trailer and in some screenshots on the website. This place shows already that we can expect some fairly diverse biomes in the DLC, and the ruins they rest on seems to be those of the Blackstone civilization, the same civilization behind the creation of the golems as well as the divine towers. Nothing is known about it beyond the fact that they have gone to ruin a very long time ago, but the Shadowlands acting almost as a snapshot of the world before the Earth Tree might be an opportunity to get some more information, as it seems this time around we will actually get to explore some actual ruins rather than just pillars. While in the background of this shot you can also see this thing over here. It's really hard to tell what it is and we do not get another angle on it. And by the way, this is not the full view of the Shadowlands. As we will see from the cover art and the rest of the trailer, there is more structures to the left and right that are not visible. And the geography also seems to be extremely chaotic and has a lot of height variation and verticality, which makes it so a lot of the areas are out of sight, tucked away in some misty valley. In terms of pure surface area though, Miyazaki has said that this DLC is a bit bigger than Limgrave, but do not let that information fool you, as it seems this time around, learning from their experience working on Elden Ring's open fields, From Software decided to focus on a much more dense map with less empty space, and I would guess a very aggressive use of layers and verticality, which would make for an area that feels a lot bigger than its actual surface would suggest. And that is already something that can be observed in the base game, with the Whipping Peninsula for example, which is an area that only accounts for a third of Limgrave, but feels much bigger than it actually is and has a lot of variety. While Leonia of the Legs for example, can often feel like mostly vast stretches of flat ground with not much going on. All of this to say that surface area says very little of how much content or playtime the DLC will have, and there seems to be a focus on incorporating and innovating on lessons learned. The team also expressed their focus on blurring the line between Legacy Dungeon and Overworld, in an effort not to only make the transition seamless, but also create new and better gameplay and exploration experiences. Next, we are treated to shots of what I think are some of the NPCs we will be meeting in the Shadowlands. 
giving us also a taste of some of the incredible armors from software has cooked for us. The first shot seems to be placed between the medium sized legacy dungeon and the main legacy dungeon, somewhere over here, close to where that fire and the belfry would be actually. I believe this is our first confirmation of Nine Time in the Shadowlands as well, and we can also see the same old moon later in the trailer with this lovely fellow. Miyazaki was asked about this enemy and refused to talk about it because of spoilers, so who knows what it is. It will remind some of you of the worm face due to its mouth, and it seems to actually have three or four pairs of eyes. Overall, a very alien looking enemy, which is accentuated by the framing of the moon in this shot. Back to the night figure, I believe that this is actually the very NPC we saw in front of Mikela's cocoon in Mogwin's palace. The cape's embroidery and color seems to match to my eye, despite the different lighting, though you guys let me know what you see. In front of him, there is what looks like a rune. In Elden Ring, each great rune received by a demigod has a distinct look to it, reflecting the influence of its user and their spirit. Radan's rune is fiery to fight the encroaching rot, while Melania's harbors her Aeonian butterflies. This rune seems to be made of pure golden light rather than gold amber crystal. The first line of the trailer insisted on Mikela's radiance, and the orientation of the circle matches that of Melania, as would be expected of the great runes of siblings. I feel fairly confident in saying that this rune was left behind by Mikela. Now, it's obviously not the actual great rune, but I wonder if these won't be the traces left behind that we will have to follow. Maybe they even act as a point of grace in the Shadowlands. This guy's armor seems to have a more ancient design, as he wears a Roman side breastplate and skirt. His black cape fur looks amazing, and his sword's motif and design is similar to Radan's guard as well. This guy is wearing a stone armor, a Havel 2.0 maybe, and seems to love his pot. A potentate, perhaps. Behind him, we get a closer look at those spiral pillars, as well as one of the major legacy dungeons of the Shadowlands. The next area is very intriguing, and its color and theme seems to relate to sleep, specifically to Saint Trina, Mikela's identity as he appeared in people's dreams. And we can even see glowing purple lilies, similar to Trina lilies in the back. This seems to be in a cave, and the figure on the ground definitely seems to fit that sleep aesthetic. Not sure if it's an NPC or a boss. And last but not least, we have what looks like a room from Raya Lucaria. In case you're wondering, there isn't such a room in the academy, but this is most certainly the exact same architecture and furnishing. It seems they are using glintstone for illumination, and at the center sits a figure very similar to who I will call John Lucaria, who can be seen in the hourglass and the grand lift of Dectus. And with this shot in particular, I am honestly very intrigued as to what exactly is the Shadowlands. My original prediction for the DLC from over a year ago was that Mikela went to sleep, or rather effectively died, in order to reach a spirit world of sorts, and we will also be going there following his footsteps. The other condition for entering the Shadowlands I mentioned earlier is to kill Radan, something I had speculated back then as being a requirement to enter this world due to him potentially being the force holding back the Eclipse, and the Shadowlands as we will see certainly has plenty of locales that sells it as an underworld of sorts. The name itself can be directly interpreted as the Land of Death, as Destined Death is very often referred to as Shadow in-game, being the Forbidden Shadow plucked from the Elden Ring at the creation of Marika's Golden Order. And that removal would fit the unknown event that has made the Shadowlands unreachable, as I had suspected that it was what closed the way to the spirit world and confined the souls of the dead to the lands between, so that they can be absorbed by the Earth Tree. However, after looking at everything we saw of the DLC, I am very perplexed at the true nature of this place and its relationship to the lands between. The presence of such a slice of Raya Lucaria Academy is extremely intriguing, and so is this character who, while visually present, through statues we have never actually heard of. There is almost an element of mirroring here going on, even putting aside the Earth Tree itself. Anyways, we will have to wait and see on that. We now see rapid shots of different locations, and this here is exactly the kind of area that would be hidden away under a cliff invisible from afar. I believe some saw this and thought of a death blight swamp, but actually there is no swamp here. The water is clear and the ground under it seems to be coursing with veins of red and gold, with bright yellow and orange flowers that can also be seen here and here. This is actually very reminiscent of some descriptions of the Crucible of Primordial Life. The Crucible Knight's armor's veiny design comes to mind. 
with the 1.0 description of those armors directly highlighting them as conduits seeding with the power of Light's Crucible, that is, the red-tinged primordial goal. The Crucible in Elden Ring is said to be where all life was once blended together, and is believed by many, including myself, to be the origin of all local life in this world, and was actually what Marika used to create the Earth Tree, being often referred to as the Earth Tree in its primordial form. Needless to say, that it is something exceedingly holy. The Crucible Knights are Knights of the Golden Order who served Godfrey, the first Elden Lord, and used the power of the Crucible in combat, by manifesting various aspects of living beings. This is the first mention of the Crucible in this video, but be warned, it's gonna be coming up a lot. The player character on this scene seems to be wearing a black feather outfit with almost nothing under, besides some rope and rags and what looks like, perhaps, a few bones, very reminiscent of the practices of the Ravenmount assassins who imitated death birds. Next, we see this seemingly important portrait with this very old and tired man next to a woman who seems to be pregnant. Her hair is black or dark red, and her outfit seems to be like a traditional Amazir or Turkish, almost nomadic style of clothing, similar to that of the warrior starting class. Finally, we have our first and proper look at the crumbling castle, you will notice that it was around here where we met Pot Havel. There is a lot going on here, so let's start from the top, literally. It seems the castle isn't just crumbling away, it is practically fading away, and it seems to be invaded by dark black roots, while the stone itself is turning to shadows. I do wonder what is going on here, and it might just be the angle, but it almost looks like the top of the castle is almost touching the veil. I wonder if it is fading because this is the border of this realm. The black roots and suspended crumbling rocks will also be reminiscent of Deathroot and Faramazula for sure. Next we can see the spiraling towers and pillars we saw around the landscape and near that town in the central area. The facade of the castle makes excessive use of these ancient reliefs which can also be found on the arches around the Shadowlands. It seems to me that this civilization was at least at some point widespread. And here is our first Berserk reference in the DLC, and it seems to be a wicker man, which is a wicker man. It's a wicker statue used by putting people inside of it and sacrificing them by burning. Miyazaki has said that it was actually a device used in the war that took place in the Shadowlands. We can see the corpses of the unfortunate losers of this war, but also what looks like skinned fire giant faces on its belt and the dragon head sticking out its side. Also a horse. The top edge looks like the wires are forming hands, so I fully expect it to have a grab attack similar to these guys from Dark Souls 1. Behind him we can see this Gelmer looking mountain in the back, placing it east of the landmass and this tall tower that we can only ever spot in the cover art of the DLC. But perhaps the strangest and most noteworthy thing about this lovely fellow is the open display of what looks like omen horns on its face, which is a perfect segue to the next enemy. First, it seems this fight is taking place inside the crumbling castle, as we can see those same reliefs and spiraling columns we have noticed earlier in the background, while the lion itself seems to be a reference to traditional Chinese lion dancing, as it is puppeteered by three or four guys inside. I have seen some people think that it was some sort of revenant or grafting at play here, but nope. As you can see, it's three dudes in a big coat, and you will always spot the one on head duty using his hands to open and close the mouth. Honestly, at this point I feel like the From Software animators are just flexing. The design of the lion itself is incredibly eerie and interesting, makes it instantly reminiscent of the lion that can be fought in the lands between with omen horns on them, but there is something wrong to its face. And I don't just say that to be mean, there is an obvious second human-like row of teeth in there, and his mane is closer to human hair. He also looks like he almost has eyebrows. His face seems to be off and squashed in, and it's when you put them side by side that you can really tell the similarities with the misbegottens. Very strange and off-putting, but perhaps not unexpected since the misbegottens are creatures believed to have been punishment for making contact with the primordial crucible, and omen horns in general 
are vestiges of the primordial crucible that can also grow on the human body sometimes. Later in the video, there is a courtyard we can tell is in the same castle where we see statues of lions with omen horns, and they also have the weird misbegotten-like short face of the puppet. Combining this with the depiction of the wicker man's face, it seems like in the Shadowlands, these features are not actually disdained, but in fact respected and put forward, which actually lines up perfectly with what we know from the main game, where it was said that these features became hated as the Golden Order society advanced, but were seen as divine in ancient times, most likely due to their ties to the Crucible, the source of all life. When questioned on this boss, Miyazaki expressed that both the Lion Dance and the Aria were representative of a culture that existed before the Earth Tree. In my video speculating on what we will see in the DLC, I claim that the arches we could see in the landscape were actually Numen architecture, based on their similarities to the ancient dynasty reliefs. Now, we see so much more of these reliefs in this castle, which we know was built by the same group as the arches throughout the Shadowlands, but a few more things came to my attention. First, the robe worn by the lion puppet actually has an interesting element added to it, which are these roots or branches growing from its neck and all over the robe, and are actually a perfect match with the growths we could see on none other than Elden John, the prime figure depicted in the ancient dynasty ruins of the Numen. And wouldn't you know it, a long time ago when I was data mining for some of the texture of the reliefs in the ancient dynasty, I had found this texture of a lion's face that looks like a Chinese guardian dog. And though it wasn't used in the game back then, guess who I found over here? The reason Numen presence is so important and exciting is that they are probably the most mysterious and important race to the narrative of Elden Ring. Marika, the central figure of the history of the lands between as we know it, is a Numen and so are the Black Knife Assassins, and in some capacity, the Nox of the Eternal Cities. The Ancient Dynasty are the progenitors of the Eternals, and as such, could be the original Numen who came from another world. On the other hand though, the obvious beast presence in their culture, and the boss using what looks like a ground type attack, for lack of better word, is very reminiscent of Bishal spells, and so is the use of lightning, another tie, to Pharaoh Mazul. So are they Farum Azula related or Ancient Dynasty related? Or both, even. At this point, it's way too early to say, but it's interesting to take apart all these visual pieces and try to list our options. But before I move on, I will be bringing up one more connection to the Numen. Later in the trailer, we see this otherworldly scene. What you can find in the background of the landscape are what looks like ships. Ships that look very similar to the ships depicted in Ancient Dynasty obelisks that retell their history. Myself and many others have interpreted this as being the arrival of the Numen to this land, or to this world. And considering in this DLC, we will be digging into Marika's past, a Numen, and the Shadowlands being described as the place Marika first descended, it seems very likely to me that all these similarities are not coincidences. I am at this point of course still speculating, but I am fairly confident that this DLC will shed some light into Numen lore and origins. Mother, wouldst thou truly lordship sanction in one so bereft of life? And here comes the star of the trailer. Mesmer the Impaler is the cover character of the Shadow of the Earth DLC, and straight away there is a lot that jumps to the eyes. The Drake Knight design similarities, the two red serpents, the red hair, the use of dark flames, and his eyes. The synopsis of the Shadow of the Earth Tree says, The land of shadows, a place obscured by the Earth Tree where the goddess Marika first set foot. A land purged in an unsung battle, set ablaze by Mesmer's flame. It was to this land that Mikula departed, divesting himself of his flesh, his strength, his lineage, of all things golden. In the cover, we can see Mesmer sitting on one of the demigod thrones we find at the Earth Tree's entrance. And during the trailer, he mentions his mother, asking if she would really allow one without light to become lord. He is most likely talking about the Tarnished, who have lost the grace of gold and their goal of becoming Elden Lord. Then, the one who would want such a thing to happen would be Marika, making Mesmer her child and a demigod. Well, we don't have to guess too much, because Miyazaki has directly confirmed this in an interview. Mesmer is one who is on the same standing as the demigods, Marika's children, and can be called a child of Marika. One thing I find interesting is that he's not saying Mesmer is a demigod and a child of Marika, rather the way he words it makes it sound like there is almost a caveat there. 
And honestly, there should be, because Mesmer seems to have been playing a huge part of Marika's campaign in the Shadowlands. This is different from even her genocide of the Fire Giants, as that would come after the birth of the Earth Tree and her becoming a vessel of the Elden Ring. But this world is where Marika came to be a god, where the war fought for that right took place. Chronologically speaking, the events we are going to learn about and the purging of the land that Mesmer led predate everything relating to the Golden Order and the Earth Tree. We don't even know if Godfrey was in the picture or of Radagon's situation at the time. And Mesmer's red hair and affiliation with fire certainly doesn't help. So I do wonder if Mesmer is a child of Marika in the same way Melina is Marika's daughter. After all, he even has the fire affinity and the closed left eye. Technicalities aside, this would make Mesmer a sort of firstborn of Marika amongst the demigods of the Age of the Earth. And behind him, we can actually find a unique statue of Marika where she is swaddling and holding a baby. The line, a land purge in an unsung battle set ablaze by Mesmer's flames, makes it sound like his existence and his accomplishments have been put under a veil and hidden away, just like the whole of the Shadowlands, which could be a callback to the nameless king, Gwyn's firstborn from Dark Souls, who was excised from the annals of history for siding with the dragons. However, the nameless king's exile was a result of treachery. Could Mesmer be the same? And actually, yes, that is very possible, as in the base game of Elden Ring, the gladiators of the arena wore serpent-themed armor as the spectators reveled in watching them getting beaten and bruised. That is because the serpent was seen as a traitor to the earth tree. Though many people jumped to the association with Rikard, who did fit himself to the great serpent and openly declared war on the earth tree, that explanation actually never made sense, as the gladiators were a thing only during Godfrey's age when the arenas were still active long, long before Rikard would go down his path, and the serpent traitor to the earth tree, though we didn't know at the time, would have been a reference to Mesmer. And the serpent is certainly his symbol. In the collector edition cover, we can see the sigil, which is very probably the sigil of Mesmer's faction. Interestingly, we can see serpents, but also fire scorching the ground, a flame reminiscent of dragon communing, and a circle knot, which I have actually no idea what it's supposed to symbolize, but we can see it being used to tie together the weaker giant. This crest, though it is hard to see, can also be found on the ground of his boss arena and on the banners of who I am pretty sure are Mesmer's knights and soldiers. And in this screenshot, we can see them patrolling with the weaker man who I would assume probably harbors the same flames as Mesmer. His soldiers are actually a good bit different from the ones found in the lands between. They use axes and round shields and their armor design gives them a slightly more Nordic look. In this screenshot, we can actually see that the pattern on their boots matches extremely well with the style found on Godfrey's armor. In combination with the use of the axe, the Shadowlands being most likely where we will find the Crucible, and the Crucible Knights being Godfrey's first warriors, I do wonder what sort of presence he had here and what role he played. In the trailer, we can hear this NPC say, They were never saints. They just happen to be on the losing side of a war which further brings attention to the conflict that took place here around Marika's ascension to godhood. The age before the earth tree was governed by the beasts and dragons, and they have always stood by the idea that for Marika to become a god, she must have taken her godhood by force from them. I highly recommend you go check out my video on the Glomite Queen and the birth of the Golden Order, as it tackles this very specific topic and the war Marika waged on the dragons and their queen for godhood before the DLC gives away the answer for good. As for Mesmer himself, he seems to embody many aspects of dragon communion and dragon hunting. His design is instantly reminiscent of the Drake Hunter armor set, and he seems to possess dragon communion eyes. His two red snakes have sprouted draconic-like wings, so maybe they were also partaking in communion with him. By the way, you can see the snakes coming out of his torso in some angles. Ew. But the fire really is his signature. And this fire is super annoying because while it looks like many other fires in Elden Ring, it's not exactly like any of them, and in fact seems to combine their different aspects. First, the fire emerges of some sort of shadow or darkness. It is vivid red and instantly recognizable as the fire of destined death, which would perfectly fit the setting of the Shadowlands actually. However, the difference is ever so slight, with there being strands of darkness which almost look like runes. But when his flame grows, it starts to take an orange and yellow color, which puts it closer to the fire of the giants. 
but still it retains the dark and red element which basically makes it impossible for me to confidently say on what kind of power he is drawing from. There seems to be also an element of godskin design to him. The serpent association, the lanky design, the bracelets, his fire that kinda looks like destined death which could be interpreted as the fully powered god slain black flame the godskin could have used in the past and the obsidian on his spear which is used to channel black flames. And talking about his spear, which he probably partially owes his title to, it actually looks oddly similar to Mogwin's trident, another hidden unsung child of Marika, who also uses his own kind of fire, blood flame, which kinda also has similarities to Mesmer's fire. And obviously the fire and snake theme is reminiscent of Rikard. And now look, I'm starting to see things in the landscape from Volcano Manor. It's like this guy is not real, he's almost like a blend of a bunch of shady demigod stuff all combined into one. And depending on what we will learn of the true nature of the Shadowlands, Mesmer's origin and the potential presence of the Crucible, it might very much be thematically and visually purposeful by From Software. Maybe he wield a sort of primordial fire or something, who knows. But there is one more thing I would like to talk about in regard to Mesmer's fire. Back when the original teaser for the DLC was released, the first thing that came to mind when looking at the landscape was just the sheer abundance on display, which many equated to something having to do with Mikela as he represents abundance while his sister is rot and decay. But now, we know that this land was actually scorched by Mesmer's fire, which makes the abundance kind of odd. Or does it? Fire is often used to cleanse a land and make it fertile again. This creates almost a cyclical relationship to each of the things embodied by Mikela, Melenia and Mesmer, who could be interchanged with Melina here too. From Software has touched upon this very narrative and theme before multiple times, be it in Dark Souls or even Elden Ring, sometimes more overtly than others, like in the Ashes of Ariandel DLC and potentially now with the Shadow of the Earth Tree. As for Mesmer's motivation and role in the DLC, it seems like he is acting as a ruler of sorts in the Shadowlands. In this very blurry concept art, we can see a statue of Marika missing its head. And this sort of vandalism makes me lean even more towards the idea that Mesmer completely turned his back on the Earth Tree. He also seems to be aware of Marika's plan to put the Tarnished on the Elven Throne, but it seems like he wants to kill us based on this quote from this trailer. Those stripped of the grace of gold shall all meet death in the embrace of Mesmer's flame. What's also interesting here is that we know that in order to enter the Shadowlands, Mikela divested himself not only of his body, effectively he died, but also everything golden. His supposed identity in the world of dreams being Saint Trina, which is purely associated with silver, lines up with this. And so potentially it seems that Mesmer will also stand as an obstacle to Mikela too. Next, we get a quick look at the new weapons and spells we can find in the DLC. But before talking about the new gameplay stuff, I want to bring your attention to these enemies over here. Again, we can see a bunch of omen horns growing over their faces. And the area they are in is the same as the one I pointed out earlier in this video as having something to do with the crucible. As you can tell by the red gold vein on the ground and walls, as well as the flowers and overall lighting of the area. The presence of these horned enemies further reinforces the affiliation to this place to the crucible. And in their hand, they are holding something very interesting. A sort of candle tree, which is reminiscent of a design of a shield found in the base game, which coincidentally is in the cave that literally has all things death-themed crammed into it. The shape is also similar to the health and steeple, which mentions a lamp wood. But perhaps the most important part here is looking a bit closer at the material it is made of, it looks like gold crystals. And if we go forward a bit, you will see this guy in what is probably a boss cutscene, who is this guy from the painting earlier, impaled with the same gold crystallized amber, which is also of a similar shape as the candle tree held by those enemies. In this scene, we are probably seeing one of the new weapon types, the throwing daggers. Actually, even in the previous shot, if you paid attention to the moveset of the character, you will see him using the dual blades with inverted grips which was confirmed by Miyazaki as one of the 8 new categories of weapons added to the DLC. Not new weapons, but new weapon categories. Of the 8, Miyazaki mentioned the reverse grip swords, dueling shields, great katanas, a new type of big sword, which didn't really make much sense in the translation, and I would guess these daggers and martial art weapons. The enemy he is fighting seems to be made out of shadow and covered in them. 
This is similar to the enemies found in the base game in the Hero's Graves. In the base game, you couldn't hurt them until you shone this special golden light on them. While in the Shadowlands, you are not bound with that restriction. But it seems we might get some context or even lore on what those shadow enemies were. Maybe we couldn't hurt them because they were not actually present in the same realm as the lands between until we shine that golden light of the earth tree. The weapon he is holding is actually the cleaver used by the misbegottens and he is wearing rags with shackles on his ankles. Since both seem to be treated like slaves, I do wonder if there is more of a connection there. The area is the same architecture as the crumbling fading castle where we fight the lion dance enemy but one thing is for sure is that this counter really loves their spirals. Here we are back to the crumbling legacy dungeon, we already talked about this footage earlier, but now we can talk about the spell which looks like from the colors and butterfly motifs might be perhaps related to Mikela Saint Trina. The enemies here are also shadows like from the previous shot. Here we are inside either one of these two legacy dungeons from the architecture, and it looks like they are under the control of Mesmer's groups as we can see his crest and their banners around the area. Also, this knight has this very cool looking heavy twin blade, which I wonder if it is another new weapon category. The player character here is using some sort of martial arts moveset and is wearing this interesting new confessor-like set. We can basically see the same scene in this screenshot and it looks like it might be the same armor, just altered without the cape and the hat, as we see this exact same crest on the hip of both characters but it can also be found on this dueling shield the player was using against Mesmer. So I wonder if it represents a completely new faction we are not aware of. One other thing I would like to point out here is the absurd amount of tall spheres all over the place, which I don't think I have seen any of the soldiers or knights use. In some screenshots we can see some people impaled, so I'm gonna go out on a limb and say this is probably where Mesmer gets his title. We get some more shots of new gear and this game seems to be using a new communion incantation but with a bear this time. A crucible bear as it seems from the horns and red orange fur. This might actually be a boss so I hope you guys like your rune bears. It's a bit hard to see but this character is actually wearing a new armor set which looks really cool and I think it's supposed to be something like this. Finally here we see this otherworldly landscape again. This is probably the most fascinating place in the trailer for more than one reason. I already talked about the potential Newman boats earlier, but this place is nothing like anything we could see from a distance in the Shadowlands. Even the sky doesn't seem to have the veil over it, and I'm really curious where this actually takes place as it also seems to have these gravestones which can be found on the lands between. Overall the location looks very otherworldly, and in this screenshot we have this lovely fellow, not sure if it's a spirit or an alien or whatever, but it's really cute somehow. Fighting the player, we have this interesting figure. This character is dressed in the same style as a pregnant woman from the painting. This Berber, Turkish, nomad style of clothing, which is reminiscent of the warrior starting class. Her swordsmanship, coincidentally, is similar to the flowing style of the blue swordsman who was of that nomadic tribe. And sealed away the ancient god of rot in the distant past. But here we have a red swordswoman rather than a blue swordsman, with the same flowing style in a blue area with flowing streams. I can't wait to find out more, especially because if we take a closer look at the blades, it looks like they have similar shape to the finger slayer blades, used by the eternal cities to betray the greater will and spelled their doom. This find is particularly important because this is the area with the Numen ships, and the face of the dancer herself kind of looks like Nightfolk to me. Next, we are extremely close to the base of the Shadow Tree. This boss is using gravitational magic while wielding what looks like a lance-sword hybrid, and the boar seems to have something resembling a sideways gravitational sigil on its armor. Also, this might sound crazy, but where are the rider's legs? I have been playing this clip back and forth so many times, and I just can't make any sense of it. Even the armor the rider is wearing seems to actually be part of the design of the boar's armor. I think the rider and the boar might actually be one entity, like they are stuck together somehow. And this next creature is super weird and uses what looks like a new aspect of the crucible incantation that shoots thorns all over the place. It seems that the players can also obtain it as seen from this screenshot. And we also get aspects of the crucible wings, something that a lot of people were hoping for. Interestingly though, the player here is using it without a seal, with weapons on both hands. So it seems to be an ash of war. And I wasn't lying when I said there's gonna be a lot of crucible mentions in this video, but this, this, should, this should be it, I think. Finally, we have this guy, which seems to actually be in the same purple sleep themed area. 
we saw earlier in the trailer. And not sure if it's the same character who transformed or if this is a different boss fight, but this boss is heavily death theme rather than sleep. Seemingly, From Software might be trying to drive that connection between death and sleep fully in this DLC. He throws a bone boomerang, which is kind of reminiscent of the weapon used by Orphan of Cause, and rides a pale horse whose lower half seems to be the black sludge coming out of the ground. The trailer ends on our first proper look of Mikela. I suspect this is probably a cutscene that acts as an ending to the DLC perhaps, and it looks like whatever happened had a profound effect on the Shadowlands. The sky is completely changed, we cannot see the veil anymore, the shadow tree seems to become grey, and it also doesn't seem to be seeping gold anymore. While Mikila is holding his hand as if to cup the gold that would be seeping from the tree. As we saw, Mikela seems to be golden and radiant alright, so I do wonder if what happened didn't involve him taking whatever power was at play here for himself. Some of you might be wondering, where is Godwin? What about the weird second tree? And is the DLC about Mesmer? Well, no. First of all, the DLC is not about Mesmer, as captivating as he is right now. Mesmer will only be an obstacle on the way, whose story we will be exploring and will be nicely entangled with the history of the Shadowlands and Marika. However, the ultimate plot of the DLC has to do with why Mikela sacrificed so much to reach this place, and what he is trying to accomplish here. And for now, my best guess is it still has to do with Godwin. And sadly, we still don't know anything about the second tree overtaking the Shadow Earth tree. This DLC will have 10 bosses, according to Miyazaki. And we're talking 10 main bosses here. So you can be certain that From Software is holding a lot back that we haven't seen yet. Either ways, we will be seeing it soon. Until then, don't hesitate to check out my other lore videos. I'm currently working on building my emancipation theory, of which I highly recommend you check out the first part about America's motivations by clicking here.